Welcome back. In today's lesson, we're going to take a look at the character of George Washington and especially his early life, what kind of went into the man that made him able to become such an incredible leader on a national level. In order to understand him a little bit, we're going to take a look at a very significant anecdote, a great little story about him. And to understand this, we're going to take you back to the year 1783. 1783 was the year that the War of Independence was officially over, even though there really hadn't been much fighting in the previous two years. It wasn't until 1783 that the Treaty of Paris was signed, which ended the conflict. So once that was signed, that Continental Army, which Washington led, which he was commander-in-chief of, essentially, no longer had a purpose, no longer was needed. And in fact, the Articles of Confederation, the governing document at the time, ordered that no standing army should be in power or should be together should there not be a threat. So they had to disband. However, the country wasn't exactly the most stable at the time. The Congress that was wasn't the most stable. You, of course, had individual states that had their own stability, but that national or Confederate Congress did not. Not only that, but many of the officers and many of the soldiers had not been adequately paid or compensated for their service, and many of them were rather angry. And so they looked to Washington as their leader, and they looked to Washington as the man with the solution. And one of the solutions was, proposed by many of the officers themselves, why don't we make Washington a king? Sure, we'll have a constitution that he serves under. We'll have a Congress like a parliament. This could work. Or if we don't want to make him a king, let's make him a Lord Protectorate, kind of like Oliver Cromwell was back in the day, early in English history. Either way, though, the idea was Washington would have an incredible amount of power, much more than, say, our president today even, and Washington would be in power for life, and then his children could reign after him. This, of course, was an idea that Washington caught wind of, and Washington had to thoroughly reject this idea. He believed, quite simply, that if he became a king, or even if he became a Lord Protectorate, which even Cromwell was unable to do very well, he believed that that would undo everything that they had just fought for. And so on December 23rd, 1783, a very key date in our history, Washington walked into Congress with several of his key officers, and there he resigned his commission. He actually gave his commission papers directly to the president, Thomas Mifflin at the time. And Mifflin was a man who had sometimes been accused of being a little bit too loose with alcohol, but was also a man who had directly worked against Washington earlier on, actually he tried to replace him with Horatio Gates. But Washington, even if he didn't have the most favorable opinion of Mifflin, respected his office as president, and resigned his commission and thus all of his authority to him. He then drew his sword and handed the hilt and handle over to Henry Lawrence, that other president from the Continental Congress, and he called Lawrence the father of our country. It was a remarkable moment in all of history that Washington, with all of his power, with all of his fame and popularity and influence, decides to give it up so he can go home to his farm and to his family. It's an incident that was not ignored in the rest of the world. In fact, King George III, they say, was having his portrait done, one of many portraits that he had commissioned throughout his life, when he heard the news. And when he heard the news, he famously said this, If this be true, then he, being Washington, is the greatest man of the age. And all this talk of him as the American Joshua is true. In other words, everything that Washington had done, he had done as a defender of home and country, specifically Virginia. And so Washington really was an American Joshua. He really was a guardian who had won complete freedom from those who didn't have rightful authority over the land in the first place. Now, Washington's beginning, his story begins on February 22nd of 1732. It was on that day that he was born at the Wakefield Estate, that great Washington estate in Virginia, not far from the Potomac. 
And it was there that he was really brought into a family of some three generations of Washingtons in Virginia. It was a family that even though they weren't, say, the wealthiest in all of Virginia, they were still well established, having some 8,000 acres. And so Washington, as a boy, was trained in things such as the arts of war, the arts of chivalry, for example. How do you properly ride a horse? How do you fence? How do you practice archery? As well as given a very rigorous education. But Washington had his own pursuits also. Washington, as a boy, loved the whole art of wilderness survival. He loved to see, how long can I survive out in the wilds of my family's land? How long can I make it just living off of the things that I find, whether it be rainwater, whether it be berries that he knew weren't poisonous, or whether it be hunting by his own hand? And so as a result, Washington really grew up knowing his lands. He really grew up having an incredible value and a pretty appreciation for all of those blessings of the soil that had been given to him. In fact, let me read to you his own words about the value of land. He says this, I think the life of a husbandman, which actually means farmer, is of all others the most delectable. It is honorable, it is amusing, and with judicious management it is profitable. To see plants rise from the earth and flourish by the superior skill and bounty of the laborer fills a contemplative mind with ideas which are more easy to be conceived than expressed. The more I am acquainted with agricultural affairs, the better I am pleased with them. I can nowhere find so great satisfaction as in those innocent and useful pursuits. Still, Washington would have an incredible challenge as a young man. When he was 11 years old, his father died. And Washington, being without a father, looked to his grandfather, for example, for support. But we're kind of left not really knowing exactly who stood in the role of training Washington to be a man during those crucial years. But what we do know is that Washington applied himself and read whatever he could get his hands on to kind of teach him how to be a man. In fact, one of the things that he curiously studied was etiquette or civility or manners. In other words, how do you properly conduct yourself when you're around people? And so Washington wrote some 110 rules of civility which discuss everything from how you should walk side by side with someone who is of great rank and how you should kind of fall back behind them, but not too far so you can still hear them. It talks about how you should ever spit in public or how you should never creep too low below a fire or how if you see some insect on the floor of the parlor that you're having a party at or you're attending a party at, then you should very discreetly kill it, but not really make a big deal out of it in the sight of others. Or you should never talk when you yawn or you should never, uh, for example, uh, sneeze too loudly. You should try to do it as discreetly as possible. And of course, we look at manners like that sometimes, and we sometimes think, well, that's kind of for sophisticated, highly refined people, and it's just something that people do to make themselves look good. That's really not what manners are about, and nor is that really what Washington was about. See, the whole purpose of manners is manners show that we actually care about the person next to us. We care about them enough to actually treat them well and speak well to them and say things like please or thank you. That's why Washington turned to that. He also, of course, turned to as many books as he could get his hands on. In fact, had a library as a man of some 700 volumes, which wasn't huge even for that day and time, but it was something significant because Washington had hand-picked the titles, and had you gone to Washington's library when he was there, you could have picked any book off the shelf, asked him about it, and he would have told you something significant about that volume. So he was a man who knew what he had, as he knew his own lands. He was a man who recorded almost everything that he did. He regularly journaled. He regularly kept all the letters he received as well as copies of all the letters that he sent, making him one of the easiest to document of all the founders. By the age of 16, he began traveling throughout uh, the lands of Virginia and throughout the lands beyond the mountains. And by the time of the Constitutional Convention, they say that Washington was probably the most traveled of any of the founding fathers. Even though he hadn't traveled in Europe, like say Franklin or Jefferson, he knew the actual states. He knew the backcountry. He knew the frontier better than any of them.
He also was a rather impressive stature. He stood somewhat six foot three. In a day and age when most people were, uh, most men that is, were under six foot or even around six and a half feet. Yet he was reserved in his speech. He said that he would rather hoe a field of turnips than talk. He would rather uh, just go about quietly and only speak when absolutely necessary. It's part of the reason why Washington commanded so much presence. He had a very stately walk and he had a very studied speech, said his contemporaries. He also demanded virtue from those around him. So for example, with his troops, he forbid them to curse. He forbid them to fight on Sundays unless they were directly attacked. He also ordered them at least nine different times to attend church services or meetings around the chaplain's tent, something that he did faithfully throughout all of his life. Thus, in 1759, Washington, being seen as the real deal, was able to marry a widow who was also quite wealthy by the name of Martha Dandridge Custis. And even though she was a widow who had many men, perhaps after her wealth, uh, she was someone that Washington married perhaps for that same wealth or for her lands, but they had an incredible romance that was lifelong. And we know that from hints such as the way that they ran their house, from their letters to each other, and from the fact that she affectionately called him my old man, even though she was older than him. But at their home and their farm of Mount Vernon, it was quite a place of hustle and bustle. There were, of course, her stepchildren, who Washington adopted as his own. And you really couldn't tell that they weren't originally his children. There were then, of course, as those children grew, their children and their grandchildren under Washington's uh, entire oversight. There were also some 25 nieces and nephews from Washington's brothers. And so Washington lived a life that was very full of family, as well as a life that was very deliberate. For example, Mount Vernon was a home that he largely added onto with designs based upon his own ideals and upon his own idea of what something should look like. And so the beautiful portico, for example, that you see on the front of Mount Vernon that stretches the whole length of the house and is designed for people to spend time together outside in the shade when there's a nice breeze blowing up the hill, uh, he designed that for that very reason. The library designed to house his books to be a place of study or the great banquet hall where they would entertain. Those were all designed with deliberate purpose of how are these rooms going to be used for something that is good. In fact, between the years of 1768 and 1775, Washington and his wife would entertain some 2,000 people of rank, an immense uh, amongst many other thousands that came through the house as well. And Washington was always in the midst having conversation, getting to know people. He was known as someone that was accessible, even if he was someone who commanded great respect. We have to understand these things in order to understand what made Washington tick, in order to understand how he was able to accomplish such great things.